Well, we've got uh, Morgan Babst here. I'm going to ask her a few questions and then have her read uh, this novel, The Floating World, which is uh, beautifully written, but incredibly painful and uh, emotionally difficult at times <laughs> because it's about uh, something most of us haven't been through, which, uh, a flood washing away most of a city and uh, people's uh, families and uh, possessions, and um, we'll get into that shortly. Um, let's, uh, let's start um, w with Morgan, who's from for 100, 150 years or so. Your family has been rooted in New Orleans. Uh, you, you both were and weren't there when the, the flood hit. So give, give us a sense of where you were. You were home from college, you'd been up north, but you were back in uh, Louisiana with your folks. The flood was coming. What was it like for you and, and, and your family when, when it uh, got close? Um, we had never evacuated before. As far as I know in, the, you know, in the entire history of my family, no one had evacuated. Um, even in Betsy, my father tells stories of you know, the water coming through the through the door, just like straight through the wood. It was, it was hitting with so much force. And so I never really expected for there to be a storm for which we would need to evacuate. Mm -hmm. So I went to bed on the night of, I think, the 27th um, of August, thinking that, you know, the next morning it would have turned, even though at that point it was this monster storm that was blotting out the entire Gulf of Mexico. But it was sort of hard for you to believe that it was really going to be this bad, because you'd never right. experienced anything like it before. Yeah. And you probably didn't know anybody who had, right? Right, right. Um, and so I woke up that morning, and I smelled waffles. And I thought, oh, good. We're having <laughs> waffles. Everything's fine. Um, and then I heard hammering, because my father was up on a ladder putting the plywood over the windows. We were on the 12-mile bridge going over Lake Pontchartrain for, I think, eight hours um, while little water spouts spun up um, on the lake. And um, sometime in the wee hours of the night, we finally arrived in Nashville. Um, and the next morning, again, we woke up. and. And there were reporters standing in slickers outside the Hyatt saying, oh no, some of the windows of the Hyatt have blown out. Mm -hmm. And we breathed a sigh of relief. It wasn't until much later that night that we knew that the flood had happened, that the levees had breached. Um, and my father and I went back in 10 days later mm -hmm. to survey the damage and to try to do something about our house, which had, um, his roof had been seriously damaged and so the by the time we got back the walls were already like blooming with mold and um, you know the refrigerators of course were disgusting um, and as we were cleaning out these refrigerators for no apparent reason it's not like they were really salvageable at that point um, it just felt like something positive and real to do um, we hear somebody shouting FBI from the front hall we go in the front hall and there's an FBI agent with his hand on his gun and his other hand on the piano. Um, it turned out he had dated my mother in college. Um, <laughs> I was there to just make sure that everything was OK. Um, but it was, it was an incredibly, incredibly surreal experience. I bet. Well, so in contrast to what your family went through, the family that this novel is based on, the Boiderets, do I have that about right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a, they went through this uh, in a complicated way. Some of them stayed, some of them went. Uh, one of them returned a few weeks before. Um, tell us a little about the family, because the book is, is in some ways as much a kind of family saga as it is a book about a disaster. I mean, it's sort of classically Southern in that way, and that this, this kind of very complex nuclear family is at the beginning of it. The, the, their name, by the way, means, I guess, golden wood in French, uh, in mm -hmm. case anybody's wondering. Um, give us a sense of them and what their relationship to, uh, to Katrina was. Sure. Um, well, the Vaudereys are, I actually based them on a, on a historically real family mm -hmm. who were um, the, the, one of the first of the Vaudereys to be um, freed from slavery, became the richest free man of color in all of Louisiana. Hmm. But he also has a, had a brother who um, vanished from the historical record. And I sort, of, hmm. I sort of gave this family 
the lineage to that brother to, as a way of sort of resurrecting him. He's one of the ghosts in the book who comes back. Um, <clears throat> so the Baudrillards are a, are a, um, a Creole family. That means they've been around New Orleans forever. Um, and have, you know, part, a, lar a large part of the reason why New Orleans is so strange is because it has this identity that is very old and based in like the original colonial history of the city that has been forged in opposition to American traditions and, you know, over and over and over again. Um, so they are, they, they come from a line of cabinet makers. The, the patriarch of the family, Vincent, um, was considered to be one of the greatest cabinet makers in the South. Um, now he's suffering from Louis body dementia. Um, his son, Joe, is an artist um, and is married to Tess, who's a white uptown woman. Um, and their daughters, Del and Cora, Del has left New Orleans for New York, trying to find some place where she can be more free. And, um, and Cora has stayed and continues to stay. Right, and then uh, early in the book, um, Dell returns. And why don't uh, why don't you read a little of that uh, when Dell, the the daughter who's gone away to New York City, comes back, uh, or contemplates coming back to uh, to New Orleans? Sure. Um, Dell has just Dell has just landed, and unbeknownst to her mother, <laughs> she's gotten herself home. Tess had been circling the terminal for a half hour now hitting redial each time she left the dusk of arrivals for the outer light. She'd looked for Dell and every young girl sitting wide-legged on her duffel, and every light-skinned woman leaning against the aggregate columns. To the rescue again, she kept thinking, Tess to the rescue. No matter what had been agreed upon, or how often Joe was reminded, or what responsibilities she had besides, it was always Tess to the rescue. Except today it seemed it was not. She made another circuit, stopped at all the crosswalks, jolted at five miles per hour over the speed bumps, kept expecting to see those amber eyes flash as Dell caught sight of her, to see the blank, disappointed look on her daughter's face change to a put-on smile, the way it always had when she was a little girl, forgotten by her father at school. But Adelaide was a grown woman now. She must have taken a cab. Tess stopped the car at the terminal's edge and looked back at the taxi stand, but there was no one in line. From the edge of the overhang, the fumes wavered like a lace curtain. She drove through it and out onto Airline Drive. The drainage canal streamed by beside her, and behind it, across the littered brown no-man's land that had once been grass, the houses flaunted their waist-high flood lines. It made her ill to think that Dell had had to see this for the first time alone. She wanted to call Joe back and scream at him, before she'd only hung up the phone. He knew as well as she did what it was like, seeing this for the first time. You could watch all the TV news you wanted. Out in Houston, they'd been glued to Vin's leather couch for days, but there was no way to adequately prepare. The flood itself had been straight out of an apocalypse movie, but the aftermath was something else. The innards of sofas strewn across lawns, cars belly up in the streets, an inch-thick crust of sewage on every goddamn thing. You almost wanted the water to come back. On TV, the flood had shimmered, glinting with sun as the news helicopters ruffled the surface. The water had hidden the mess, lifted everything up, given the city a sense of buoyancy. It had kept you from having to really believe it, and if she could have stayed there, safe in her dream of disbelief, in the gin-smogged twilight zone of Vin and Zizi's suburb, that purgatory of vacuums and air conditioning and chain restaurants, she might have. If they had all gotten away, maybe they could have stayed away. If the second hurricane had swerved just a little east and destroyed New Orleans once and for all, if they hadn't left Cora there, if she hadn't, in the end, been found. Tess couldn't say this out loud, of course. Not to anyone, certainly not to the girls. Once upon a time, both of them had come to her for advice, snuggled up in the big bed in the early morning, let Tess stroke their heads. Once upon a time, they had let Tess see them cry, had come running even. But that had ended a long time ago. Now she wasn't allowed to help, wasn't allowed to see the tears. And the last time she could remember Dell asking her a serious question was her senior year in high school, when she'd taken it into her head to skip college and stay home to apprentice in Vincent's workshop instead. 
Tessa told her no, and Adelaide hadn't liked that answer, and that had been the end of it, of everything, apparently. She would admit she'd been glad when Joe had phoned to say he'd pick her up from the airport. Del was daddy's girl, despite everything. She was still open with him, whereas with Tess, she was shut watertight, her shoulders hunched, bra straps showing. But he hadn't come, had he? Beyond the far lane, Tess caught sight of the Coca-Cola facade of the roller rink, where the Velcro skates and cookie cut cutter cakes of all those childhood birthdays must have bobbed against the disco ball ceiling in the flood. She could still hear the sound of the wheels, the DJ in his tinseled booth, Adelaide skating all sweaty through the break in the wall and into her arms, could still feel the impact of a head on her ribs just over the heart. She made a U-turn and pulled into the rink's parking lot, where the blue box of a payphone hung from a pole, and stood up out of the car into the flat desert heat of asphalt. Leaving the engine on to pump air conditioning at her through the open door, she rummaged in her skirt pocket for change. There was not another soul out here, no one as far as she could see along the frontage of strip mall and fast food and warehouse, and when she dropped the quarter on the pavement, she broke out in a cold sweat. Something had gone terribly wrong, as wrong as carpools crashed on highways, children kidnapped from among the wax-cold pizzas and skee-ball lanes. Behind the swinging doors of the skate center, there would be nothing but a dirty red carpet and warped wood floor and the plexiglass box where a claw was always reaching, never holding, like a palsied hand. She put the quarter in the slot, dialed the Dobie's landline. The phone miraculously rang. Hello, this is the Dobie residence, Del said, formal as she'd been trained. Oh, thank God, honey, you're there. Are you all right? Yeah, I, I took a cab, it's okay, Del said. I had cash. I can't believe, I just can't believe your father. You shouldn't have had to see this alone, honey. I'm a grown woman, mom, I can handle it. Del laughed, dismissive. Tess should have expected that. Anyway, she was chewing Triscuits. She was Triscuits and that crummy Popeye dip she'd bought. Grief is the loneliest emotion. Isn't that what you always say, Dr. Eshelman? Well, Tess pulled herself up and back, the silver cord going tight against the pole. Well, I'm sorry anyway, I shouldn't have left it to him. I should have come for you in the first place. Mom, stop apologizing. It's okay. Everything's fine. No, Tess said, shaking her head against the heavy receiver. No, it's not. Well, Cora does look like hell, Del said, crunching Triscuits. Tess laughed. Ain't that the truth? And you've got me sleeping on a shitty sofa bed in a fire trap? Tess laughed again. And of course, the city's a fucking bombed out wasteland. She didn't know why she was laughing, but she couldn't stop. Reflected on the hood of her car, her face looked like a funhouse freak's, her mascara running, her dyed hair standing up like a clown's wig, her features warped. But everything's fine, sure, Del was saying as Tess laughed, bent over her legs. Everything is completely fine. The water, Tess had heard, had come up through the manhole covers once the drainage canals were overwhelmed. It had not, as she'd always imagined, come as a great wave rising above the river levee the way unladen ships did in spring. No, it had been more active and more sinister. It had broken what was built to keep it back. It had snuck in long channels dug to lead it away. It had acted as if with the intent to swallow, to smother, to ruin, to uproot, but most of all to lift. It had raised sewage, dirt, poisons, furniture, cars, homes, families, high above the ground, as if to allow God to get a better look. And the things he rejected, it had dropped and left strewn in ruined piles. Mm, wow. <clears throat> you get a, we get a sense of it in that passage a little bit. Uh, the sensory detail in the book, especially uh, in the immediate aftermath of the flood, is, um, and the ruined houses and the mold and so on, is almost overpowering it parts in the book. I think it's the first novel I've read in a long time that I feel like I can actually smell. <laughs> and, uh, Sorry. I just, yeah, I know. I, I feel, uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm happy about that. Anyway, um, did, did, did you work really hard to try to put readers in the, the time and place of, of the book? I mean, was that something sort of foremost in your mind as you were writing this? Um, I, think my, I think my conscious thought w or my subconscious intention was more that I wanted to be in the time and place mm -hmm. of the book. Um, after my father and I had gone back, 
I we had to evacuate again because Rita Rita was coming. Right, um, right. And oh. um, I wound up on various couches in New York with um, some of you. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then I sort of got stuck. Um, I met my husband there, and was we had this we had this re renewal. We had this like three year plan that was renewed four times. Right. And during that time, I was writing this book, and I think. I think in part I wrote it with so much um, so much density because I was trying to write myself back to New Orleans mm -hmm. and back into this place that I felt like I'd abandoned. Right. So you were trying to summon those details for yourself to kind of remember what it was like to be there. Yeah. Right, right, right. P part of what you've, I think you've argued this yourself and, and sort of dramatized in the novel is that the mess of Katrina was not this inevitable uh, act of God or really a natural disaster exactly. I, I think it was one of your characters called it a, a massive kind of hate crime, I think. What are, what are you or what is she getting at in, in that, uh, with that line? Um, I mean, it, there, there was the storm that blew out some of the windows in the Hyatt, but right. then there was the levee failure. Right. Which was something that we knew about in advance, um, and that nothing had been nothing had been done to fix. I mean, there were there was a series of Pulitzer Prize winning articles in the in the Times Picayune that said that the Army Corps had you know underbuilt and you know that there were these terrible um, errors in the construction of them. There were the construction implements buried in the levees. Some of them were built with like playpen grade sand. Right. Um, so we knew that we were not protected in the way we were told that we were supposed to be protected mm -hmm. from these storms. Um, and then the levees broke, and then people sh shot at people trying to leave New Orleans going over the bridges. People were killed on the Danziger. People were turned back on the Crescent City Connection. People were stranded at the convention center and the Superdome in the heat without supplies for days and days. Um, and so, you know, there, the, the natural disaster part was bad. Um, the human disaster part was much, much worse. Right, right, right. <clears throat> I'm not breaking any news to say this, but the last, I don't know, decade or so has seemed, seemed to have a lot of these. I mean, I think it was soon after you left to go to New York, uh, maybe a couple years, um, you had a daughter, and Hurricane Sandy slammed into uh, slammed into New York and New Jersey. We have fairly recent memory of uh, of the flood in Houston, which really wiped out a major American city. Here in California, we had enormous fires, the worst I can remember in Napa and Sonoma. Mm -hmm. I wonder if if you think there's any besides obviously the fact that these are all really bad and unpleasant to go through. Do you think there's any 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 sort of lesson of what we're going through these days with what seems to be a once in a lifetime, you know, catastrophe every year or two. Yeah, and I, I, I do think that the, the idea of the 100 year flood, 100 year storm, the, you know, the, the devastating disaster that couldn't possibly happen to you right. is, is a big, big problem. I think, I think our resistance to the idea that disaster can happen to us prevents us from protecting ourselves and our and our communities better than we do. Um, and, you know, for instance, Puerto Rico, it, it was this very similar situation to what happened in Katrina, where, you know, we, we are a pseudo island, they're a real island, they've been asking for help, and they're still not getting the help that they need. Right. So. Right, and um, it all becomes, it's like an illness, it becomes much more difficult and painful to fix after it's gone bad than yeah. if we sort of prepare for it. So let's talk sort of literary uh, for a second. Um, give us a sense of the writers or the, the books that you read uh, that were important to you, that either made you want to become a writer as a kid or that helped sort of give you a sense of how it worked as you were moving into your craft as an adult. Yeah. Um, well, since we're, we're in this beautiful library today, it was the, the latter library down the street from my house was Ooh. kind of where my reading identity was was forged. I read through the entire like children's and young adult section mm -hmm. and summers mm -hmm. up trees in, in, in um, Audubon Park. And when I'd finished um, 
reading all of those, I went upstairs to where the adult section was, feeling very sheepish. Like, I was like, I don't think I belong up here. Somebody's going to kick me out. And so I very quickly like huddled in fiction, turned around in a circle, and closed my eyes and reached out hmm. and wound up with Madame Bovary. Oh, wow. Which <laughs> How I, old do you think you were at that point? I think I was maybe 11. Uh-huh. Um, which I then quickly checked out before, you know, the librarians could catch on. Right. And uh, took it to the park and was immediately just absolutely hooked. Huh, even at 11 that made sense, or enough sense. Well, yeah, to... I mean, I don't think I really understood right. what was going on, but I think the beauty of the language and the sensitivity to the psychology right. Right. Um, really got me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Faulkner has been, you know, right. he, he he's one of those writers who, you know, changes your ideas about how to... Um, how to how structure and voice can infect the mind of the reader. Right. Um, and lately, I'm lately I've been very into Maggie Nelson, who oh, has huh. a yeah, who lives here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Went to Wesleyan. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Who has a very who has um, also another sort of groundbreaking um, structural um, way of writing where you're kind of you're just kind of forced to reside inside of her mind while you're reading her work. So, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but the, the novel is broken into three very distinctive uh, sections that allow you to move around in time. Um, give, and for a, I probably don't have to point out, for a, uh, for a novel like this, it's very much about the impact of a catastrophe being before it or right in the middle of it or after it. It's all a very different way to experience, uh, for this family to experience it. Why did that seem to make sense and what did it allow you uh, to do? I wonder if it was coming from Faulkner or, or one of those modernist writers who tended to fragment narratives like that. Yeah, I, th I think in some ways I was thinking about like The Sign on the Fury, like right. the, uh, the, the idea that if you have to piece together an experience along with the characters, then you become more involved in the experience and more mm -hmm. empathetic with them. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think that in an emergency, it's the aftermath that that has meaning or has value. And so I wanted to start, like even in a even in a car wreck or something, you don't really know that you're in a car wreck. You know that you've right. just been in a car wreck. Right. Um, and it's only in the aftermath that you can look back and figure out why this thing happened. Mm -hmm. um, and and then go even farther back and say, well, what were the forces that caused caused the emergency? Um, how you know? How might I might how might I have behaved differently? And what do I do now right. to recover from it in a way that's going to cause my life to be more sustainable in the future, mm -hmm. if that's even possible? Mm -hmm. So, again, you, you went through something similar to one of your characters, but with I don't know ten and a half years, I guess, added to the departure. <laughs> you uh, went to college uh, in the north, uh, came back, the flood, the hurricane and the flood hit, you went away for 10, 11 years, uh, came back maybe a couple years ago, is that? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, about, about a year So ago. was that, and along the way you're writing a novel about something that happened 12 years ago in a city that is at that point sort of 1,200, 1,300 miles away. What was it like to contemplate um, returning um, as, at this point, a, an adult and a wife and mother, uh, you know, a, a sort of a grown-up in your mid-30s coming back to a city that's been through this incredibly wrenching experience, but also is, um, continues to be a cultural capital for food, music, literature, all these other things. Yeah. Um, I made it into this great big deal, like, you know, I sort of felt like I was dragging my family back there, and you know, I, I freaked out about it for about a year. But it was it was almost like a vis it was almost a visceral need. Hmm. It got to the point where every time I left New Orleans, I felt like I was pulling out my teeth. Right. It was um, it, New Orleans has that effect on a lot of people. I'm not just the only crazy person in, in this, <laughs> with this experience. Um, but it, it got to where I just couldn't deal with not being there. I felt oh. like I was losing part of my identity. Right. Um, and so I finally break down in the kitchen one night. And I was like, Scott, I, we have to go home. But like, I'm going to go home. You can come. <laughs> and um, he looks at me and he goes, well, I want to go home too. 
Um, and right, and your, your husband is from New Orleans. He's from New, right? he's from so, New Orleans. Yeah. So uh, we figured it out. And um, I mean, I, I had been going back, you know, for two months total every year, basically, while I was gone. So the, the changes in the city are something that I've seen happen gradually. They're still alarming. Um, but it does, it does feel like home again. And I think I'm finally getting to the point where my like passionate love for New Orleans isn't completely overwhelming my ability to see the, the issues and the problems that continue to exist there. Right, right. So, again, you were gone for more than a decade and you left during, obviously, uh, you, you, when you departed that, that night in, uh, in 02, so, 05. 05, you didn't have a sense of saying goodbye for, for 11 years. You thought you were fleeing something that would be unpleasant but would be back to normal in a few weeks. So what was it like to come back a decade later to this city that, again, my sense of it, uh, there are a lot of people in L.A. who have connections to New Orleans through music, especially, and people whose families are from there. So I get a set, I get reports you know, from, from uh, people who go to Jazz Fest and people with, with the roots. My sense is that it's, it's returned in a lot of ways as a functioning city, and it's returned as an arts capital, but that it's also been sort of gentrified and indelibly changed in a, in a deep way. Does it seem that way to you? Yeah, I, I mean, we lost, we lost about a quarter of our people. Mm -hmm. um, Especially black people and poor people, I think. Yes, and yeah. I mean, it, we lost the Lower Ninth Ward, which was right. like a very important cultural like generator. Right. Um, and so even though like, and, and, and we've now basically like the Bywater which was the upper ninth ward when I was growing up is, is now basically Brooklyn. Right, right. right. Um, in a pretty alarming way. <laughs> um, I, I, and I know some people who've moved there, li literally moved there from Brooklyn. So, yeah, yeah, I, and I, I expect I, you do too. Yeah. I, my, 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 and that was actually the one shock that I've had in post Katrina New Orleans is my friend um, was in town from San Francisco for Jazz Fest, of course, and was, of course, staying at an Airbnb in the Bywater. And I drive him in. And I'm like, I have no idea where I am. There's like, I, there are so many boutiques selling right. handmade shoes. Right, right. Um, so there, there are some, there have been some alarmingly rapid changes in New Orleans, and there are still these huge gaps. New Orleans East is also still like, it just in, in horrible shape. They never really rebuilt it. You know. it. It was, yeah, it's been, it's been very difficult to mm -hmm. really get that back up and running again. Um, uh, in some in some ways, like we've maintained um, we've maintained our culture, but in other ways, I see us holding on to it so tightly that I'm worried that it won't be allowed to evolve in a way that will keep it alive. Hmm. Right. Right. Interesting. So um, you've spent um, oh probably a, a decade or more uh, trying to develop yourself as a writer, to write a novel, to get it published. You have a MFA from NYU, I think, and have a long trail of uh, essays in, I think, Oxford American, Garden and Gun, other publications. So I, I think I and many people watching this kind of wonder, what's it like to break in as a young novelist these days? I mean, it seems like a very, given where the culture has gone, being so much more oriented toward technology and and uh, sort of Silicon Valley hijinks. You know, it feels like a very retro thing to do. <laughs> um, I'm pleased people are still trying to do this. People are still buying books. People are still running bookstores that allow you to purchase this thing. Um, but what's it like to, um, to, to, to develop your craft and then to get a book published for the first time? And uh, what kind of, just wondering what kind of sort of uh, tenacity, it, it, what degree of tenacity it requires to do it? Um, yeah, I, I think probably tenacity is the primary thing that you have to have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have two, I have two terrible novels in drawers. Well, the, the first, the first one I, I wrote under the influence of like two euro wine. It's got like <laughs> mermaids and Rocky Raccoon and it's set in Marfa, <laughs> Texas. I mean, nothing about oh, wow. it makes any sense at all. Jeez. Um, <laughs> So that was that was sort of my attempt to see if if I could write a novel 
And your, then, your magical mystery tour or something. Yeah, right? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I did, I did study with Bob Stone in college, oh, right. so uh -huh. you know, some of that might have rubbed off. That's on me. right. He was at Yale. That's right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was, great writer. Yeah. He was awesome. Yeah. I miss him. The late great. Yeah. Um. And, you know, in the second one I wrote during my MFA, and it's, well, how do you write a novel? Right. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this one is a novel. Um, that was your self-conscious MFA novel? Yeah. About <laughs> it was, it sort worked, of worked the hypothetical, right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, um, I mean, the, I, do, I do occasionally have a glimmer of the, of the current media landscape, and I'm afraid but I'm a, I'm a pretty <laughs> retro person anyway. Like, you know, right. if I'm doing a dying thing, I'm just gonna keep doing it. Right, right. I, I, I write my first drafts longhand, for God's sake. <laughs> wow, that is old fashioned. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the thing that, um, that I'm always as I'm going to anticipate that somebody's, uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to open this up for a question or two at the end, but I'm gonna anticipate, do you think that it's important or valuable to get a, get a writing degree. There's all kinds of, obviously, debates as to whether um, uh, academia helps develop or helps sap a writer's kind of talents and strength. There used to be um, uh, journalism as a app possible apprenticeship. That's become more difficult, but that's another way that, that fiction writers tended to, um, to sharpen their skills. Um, what do you think is the best uh, way, and, and do you think it's necessary to get a, uh, to get a, uh, to get a writing master's? Yeah, I don't know if an MFA is necessary. I think it probably is important to study the craft at some point, mm -hmm. just so that you have, the, you have the tools and the language that you need to know what you're doing wrong, because mm -hmm. you're inevitably going to be doing a lot of things wrong. Um, the, and, but I, th I think an MFA is useful because it gives you time to, right. and sort of the, the imprimatur to carry on with your work as if it's important. Right. Um, and it also gives you a community of people that you need then and continue, you will continue to need. Just afterwards. something as simple as having a friend to say, can you read this and tell me that it's not completely terrible or... Yeah, you know, and, it, and, and having a good reader isn't, it's not, it's not easy to find those right, people. Yeah. People who are willing to read eight drafts of a 700 page manuscript. Right. Like, <laughs> they're not just standing around outside your door. <laughs> <laughs> right, life would be a lot easier if they were, but yeah, it's not likely to happen. Yeah. Right. So that, I mean, I think I think that's I think that's sort of the use of the, the use of that. Um, you can you can find it in books, but you can't you can find the you can find the the knowledge in books, but you can't find the, the community. In books. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, well, so again, you've written some some nonfiction, and again, any of you interested in the novel, I urge you to find uh, pieces that Morgan's done in these uh, these magazines. Uh, the, some of which are, at least the ones I read, were first person and in some ways quite different in style and tone than the novel, though they're based on similar themes. New Orleans and the South are part of the piece I saw. So with that in mind, I just wonder what's next for you as a writer. You're on a book tour. You're near the end of it now. Uh, I wonder if you have uh, short stories you're thinking of, more nonfiction, or another novel in mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have, I have, I have a few... I have a few essays that I'm kind of working on right now, and I'm reading around my next my next novel, um, which I think it's going to be sort of a like a subtly political literary noir. Hmm. But wow. um, we'll see we'll see what happens with that. Do Do you think that I mean it's interesting and also in some ways totally not surprising that coming from a family of six or eight generations in New Orleans that you left and. I mean, like a lot of Southern writers, you left and then you felt this sort of centrifugal pull to come back. I wonder if you feel that intellectually as well. In other words, if you try to write a political novel or you try to set a novel in Britain or New England or whatever, if you feel like your subconscious will be driven back to New Orleans as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've I think I've tried to write things elsewhere, and my, my subconscious is driven mm -hmm. back to New Orleans. I mean, that's where that's where the that's where my the real depth of my of my history and stories and memories are. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think I tried to fight it as a 
as a controlling setting for a while, but right. I'm not. I, I'm going to give up on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I mean, to some extent, it's true. I think of anybody who comes from anywhere, right? I mean, if your parents, your grandparents, your childhood experiences, and so on are in this place, you're going to have a deeper connection to that than any place you go as a grown-up for a few years. But New Orleans is unusual. I mean, there are other unusual places like New York and California and England and so on. But it's unusual that there's so there's such a like thick body of references there, right? So if you're a writer or a musician or something, there's just so many decades of work either written there or set there, or it would just feel like something that would be very hard. I guess that's like what Mississippi was like for Faulkner, right? And what Dublin was like for Joyce. Like he could leave Dublin, but even when he was living in Zurich or Trieste or whatever, he was always writing about not just his native country, but the same fairly small city that he was from. So yeah. uh, I think some places, childhood will always call us back, but I think some places in a particular have a particular kind of gravity to them mm -hmm. and, uh, and density. And I think clearly New Orleans is that for you. Um, let's uh, get a couple questions if anybody has them, and then I think um, Morgan will sign books in uh, the uh, in the lobby. Anybody want to know uh, want to know more about um, the novel or Morgan Babs? Ma'am, um, I just want to know, like after you wrote this book, did you feel that it helped heal you? And I'm going to repeat that in case uh, it's not coming through. Uh, the question was, did writing this book help heal, a uh, book about a tragedy for the city, did it help heal you having been through and heard about all of the terror people had experienced? I think I had, I had hoped that it would. <laughs> um, I think I was writing it almost as sort of a therapeutic exercise in some ways, a way of like of, of sort of psychoanalyzing myself through these five characters and 700 pages. It's not 700 pages anymore, by the way. <laughs> um, um, and, and so when I, when I turned in my final draft, and it was, around, it was around the time of the 10th anniversary of the storm, um, and the feeling of like trauma just flooded back over me again, I, I realized that in some ways I was in writing the book, I was pushing it away from myself um, and saying, I, I'm not going to deal with it, but they're going to deal with it. The waterways are going to deal with it for me. Um, and luckily around that time, I found that I, I, made, I made a new friend who, you know, kind of held my hand and was like, it's okay that you're still upset about this. Like, you know, and it was sort of around that time that I realized that I had been avoiding going back to New Orleans. I had, a, I had been avoiding really engaging with my feelings of, you know, guilt and shame for not having, not having been there. Um, and, and then I started to really deal with it. Huh. Uh, I thought I saw, sir. How do you, how can you compare the catastrophes with Puerto Rico or New Orleans? One hundred, one's a, uh, in the, uh, Puerto Rico practically destroyed. Certain areas were eliminated completely. Right, so the the, the New Orleans rebuilt itself. It'd be much easier for them to rebuild itself than New the Puerto Rico will. So the the question is about the total devastation in uh, Puerto Rico compared to the what we can now see was temporary devastation uh, in New Orleans. How similar are they uh, really? Yeah, I don't I don't in any way mean to in 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 making a comparison mean to. Um, say that what happened in Puerto Rico wasn't wasn't worse. Um, it, we we did lose entire neighborhoods in New Orleans as well. Um, some are still gone, I think. And some said, are still right. and some are still gone. And I'm hoping that in a decade, Puerto Rico will have also figured out a way to rebuild. But um, I do think that there are. You know, I think I think that we can see each other's grief and mm -hmm. see each other and, and try to help each other and be compassionate with one another for, for what happened. So New Orleans is below sea level. That's right. Does that make a difference? Um, it, yeah, for sure. It doesn't help. For sure, it doesn't yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have one more, uh, uh, sir? 
Um, the title of the film world, kind of besides the historical tradition, suggests like an ephemeral kind of fantasy land, while the, yeah. you know, the novel is grounded in these kind of very heavy, real events um, and, and a very, a very real pace. Uh, can you talk about that? So the, the, yeah. the question is about the, the title has a kind of mythical, evocative, almost fantasy, the floating world sounds like a, uh, some kind of fantastic thing, while the novel is very realist, full of detail. Do you see these as different, uh, different impulses? Mm -hmm. um, the title is something that came to me in the process of writing the book. Um, there's a point at which Dell um, goes into the basement at Sotheby's and picks up the Hakusai um, woodblock of um, the wave off the Great Wave of Kanagawa, which we all know it's almost a cliched image. Um, and in looking at it um, and reading about it, I realized that it was part of um, this part of a genre of art that is called images of the floating world, which are about ephemerality, but not in a, not in sort of a flighty, fairyish way, about the fact that everything that we know is bound to depart. Everything that we know it will disappear. Um, and that struck me as very appropriate to the particular trauma of having your entire city evacuated, um, abandoned, most many of many of its houses destroyed, um, and and it also you know just the basic words um, combined with the image of looking at the city from a helicopter and seeing the roofs floating on the water seemed appropriate to the novel. All right, folks. Uh, Morgan will be signing her book in the lobby. Thanks much for uh, coming to see her discuss the floating world. Thank you very much. Thank you.